There are lots of symbiotic relationships. There's a balance there. And just like in a thriving city where collaboration and interconnectedness lead to prosperity, the microorganisms in the soil rely on each other to perform their functions effectively. Creative solutions are the best contributions we make. Welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. On the show, it's my job to tease out the creative solutions my guests are coming up with to change the world through creativity, social action, and mindset. I also give you tips and techniques so you can do the same. This episode is brought to you by my class, Meditation for Busy People, where you can discover clarity and joy in just five minutes a day. It's also brought to you by the Brain FM app and this podcast host, Podbean. Also, follow the podcast on Instagram or TikTok and check out our shop for merch, music, and musings. The links are all in the show notes. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here for another Vegan Life Solutions episode. I'm really excited to talk about this in part because I worked at NASA for many years doing soil science education for a program called the GLOBE program. I worked for the principal investigating scientist for soil characterization, and I got to travel all over the world and teach workshops on how to do the science to study the soil in your local ecosystem. And I loved it. So today I'm going to be, this is the penultimate episode, by the way, in the veganism and the environment series that I've been doing for the last ooh nine weeks. And we're going to dive into and talk about the really fascinating connection between soil health and vegan agriculture. So we're going to uncover the regenerative potential of plant-based farming methods that promote sustainable land use and nourish the very foundation of our food system, the soil, right? That's, that's the, again, this is so close to my heart. And in fact, whenever I teach a workshop on soil science, I call it soil, the dynamic skin of the earth. And it really is. It, it is the very surface. There's very little of it. Teeny tiny percentage of the world's surface is actually arable soil that has to grow all the food to, grow, to to feed all of the beings to house all of the trees and also turns out the houses and the parking lots and the shopping malls and the hospitals and everything. It's almost always built on soil and the stuff we use as far as construction where we build is almost always going to be that same kind of really good soil for growing things. So it is a not only a, a, a very vibrant an important natural resource, there's very little of it around. And that's one of the reasons we have to take care of it (laughs) as well as we possibly can in order to make sure that we have soil enough to feed the many billions of people who are on the planet, not to mention all of the other beings that need the soil to grow the food that they eat and also the kajillions of microorganisms who call the soil itself their home. So let's get started. Imagine the soil as a vibrant tapestry, intricately woven with nutrients, microorganisms, and organic matter, as well, of course, as minerals. It's the living, breathing skin of our planet. It supports plant growth, it filters water, it stores carbon, it does so much. It, it <laughs> Soil is glassware. Soil is your china. Soil is the vase that you put the flowers in. Soil is in so much. Soil is medicine. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Neosporin, the, the antibiotic ointment, comes from the excretion of a microorganism that only lives in the soil. So there, there are so makeup. There's so many different things that soil is. But Again, as I mentioned earlier, there's very little of it. So we have to we have to manage what we have correctly or uh, we're in trouble. And sadly, our conventional agricultural practices have disrupted the delicate balance. They've depleted the soil of its vitality and they compromise constantly its ability to sustain life. And I think it's time to reimagine our approach to farming and embrace the power of vegan agriculture. Just like a skilled conductor 
orchestrates a symphony. Vegan agriculture harmonizes with nature's rhythms. It embraces regenerative practices that mimic the natural processes of the ecosystem. So instead of relying on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, vegan farmers focus on building soil health through techniques like cover cropping, crop rotation, and composting. These methods not only nourish the soil, but also improve water retention, they prevent erosion, and they reduce the need for harmful chemicals. Let's zoom in and explore the hidden world within the soil. It's a bustling city. (laughs) It really is. It's a metropolis teeming with billions of microorganisms from bacteria and fungi to earthworms and nematodes. They form a diverse and interconnected community working in harmony to break down organic matter, release nutrients, and create a fertile environment for plants to thrive. Just like a vibrant city, like New York City, you know that's where I live, each microorganism has its own role to play, contributing to the overall health and vitality of the ecosystem. So imagine walking through a city street and observing the hustle and bustle of people going about their daily activities. In the same way, in the soil, bacteria are like the diligent workers, decomposing organic matter and converting it into nutrients that plants can absorb. Fungi act as sort of the architects, and you would not believe how big some fungi get. We don't understand how incredibly massive some of these fungi are beneath the surface of the soil. And they weave an intricate network of mycelium that connects plant roots and facilitates nutrient exchange. Earthworms are the chic and charismatic engineers of the underground world. They burrow, they tunnel, they tunnel through the soil, they improve its structure and allow for better water infiltration. And when I talk about structure, I'm talking about the actual shape of unique soil, what they call peds. Right. And I don't know if you know this, but the soil sphere, you know how you have the hydrosphere and the atmosphere for water and air. The soil sphere is called the pedosphere and a unit of soil is called a ped. And each ped has a structure or it is structureless. So when we're talking about certain kinds of soil structure, you might have granular soil structure. And that looks kind of like a handful of cookie crumbs. You might have blocky soil structure, which is a little bit bigger. Imagine a handful of hunks of Toblerone. I'm doing food metaphors. Uh Uh-oh, I must be hungry. Then there are prismatic soil structure, which is sort of like, uh, imagine a a prism, like a a crystal. And then there there are structureless soil structures, if you will, which is single grain is like sand at the beach where it all falls apart, or massive, which are huge hunks that don't break anything routinely into a specific type of ped so and there are others too but the point is that when we're looking at soil structure the way it is aerated the best way that it is aerated are through those earthworms and other critters that live in the soil and also sometimes through roots right decaying roots from trees leave those holes and one of the things that you need to understand about the soil as far as arability and by by arability i mean does it grow plants and does it grow plants well, uh, the ideal uh, sort of volume of soil is going to be these ratios. It's going to be about 45% minerals, 5% organic matter, and 25% each of air and water to make up for the ideal volume of soil. And we don't realize how much air and water the soil needs in order to really grow those plants, but that's what it needs in order to do that. So when you're talking about soil structure, you start imagining, okay, where does that water go? Well, if it's a massive structure, which is, you know, huge hunks, there's not going to be a lot of room for water. But if it's granular structure where there's lots of little nooks and crannies, you're going to have more room for air and more room for water. And that's why those earthworms are so incredibly important, right? So there are lots of symbiotic relationships. There's a there's a balance there. And just like in a thriving city where collaboration and interconnectedness lead to prosperity, the microorganisms in the soil rely on each other to perform their functions effectively. Vegan agriculture recognizes the importance of preserving this hidden ecosystem and takes steps to nurture and protect it. By avoiding harmful chemical fertilizers and pesticides, 
vegan agriculture avoids disrupting the delicate balance of the soul microbiome. Instead, it embraces organic practices that enhance biodiversity and promote soil health. For instance, organic matter such as compost and cover crops acts as nourishment for the underground community, providing a constant source of food and habitat. This encourages the proliferation of beneficial microorganisms and helps suppress harmful pests and diseases naturally. The impact of fostering a thriving soil ecosystem goes beyond the boundaries of the field. Healthy soil acts as a sponge. It absorbs and retains water, and that reduces the risk of erosion, and it improves water quality because that's one of the soil's function is it's a beautiful water filter, like a Brita filter that filters the water and filters out potentially harmful pollutants in the water. That's exactly what the soil does. The soil also sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. It mitigates climate change by storing carbon in the soil. Now, imagine this. There are stores of carbon that, for example, have been in the permafrost, the very frozen part, permanently frozen, permafrost, permanently frozen parts of the soil around the North Pole, not at the North Pole, but around it, like in in some of these northern reaches of uh, Russia or Norway, there's what they call permafrost. Supposedly, it never, never melts. But some of that permafrost is melting, and that is releasing those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as it melts. Carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases are being released as that permafrost, the stuff that was supposed to be totally frozen soil forever, permanently frozen, isn't anymore. And some of that is going to exacerbate this climate change, climate crisis that we are already in. So these are things that we need to be thinking about when we're talking about some of the things the soil does and why we need to be super, super careful about how we manage this crucial and vital natural resource, right? So that's part of it. But the other part, of course, is feeding the world. (laughs) That's one of the things we really need the soil to do. And so when plants grow in nutrient-rich soil, they themselves become more resilient to pests and diseases, and that reduces the need for chemical intervention like pesticides and fertilizer. That's one of the things that we need to understand is that vegan agriculture recognizes this incredible potential that lies beneath our feet. It acknowledges that the health of the soil directly impacts the health of the plants, the animals, and ultimately our own well-being. By adopting vegan agricultural practices, we can nurture this underground metropolis, fostering biodiversity, improving soil fertility, and unlocking the full potential of the the land, of the soil, of <laughs> the mother, of the thing that provides all of the food for all of the living beings on this planet. Now we can say yes, but you can grow things, you can grow stuff in in water like hydroponics, but the amount of resources that takes to yield the same amount of crop is vastly different than the amount that it takes of soil. That's one of the things. Hydroponics does work but does not do it nearly as efficiently as the soil does. So that's why we need to be super careful about how much we mess with the soil and how much we, quite frankly, destroy arable soil in our quest to get bigger, better, faster crops. So important to think about that. Okay. So let's move on because you know me, I could start talking about this and I would be just talking about it forever. I want to keep con- keep exploring this, these vegan life solutions to celebrate the vibrant and diverse community hidden beneath the soil surface. I want to embrace the principles of vegan agriculture and work hand in hand with nature to cultivate a thriving and sustainable future. Now, let's explore another groundbreaking practice that is revolutionizing the world of vegan agriculture and and non-vegan agriculture alike, and that is no-till farming. In conventional farming, tilling the soil is a common practice to prepare the land for planting. However, this process disrupts the soil structure, and we talked about why that was important earlier. It exposes the soil to erosion. It releases carbon stored in the soil into the atmosphere. No-till agriculture offers an alternative approach that minimizes soil disturbance by eliminating or significantly reducing tillage operations. 
I want you to picture a garden with lots of layers intricately woven of vegetation. Just like nature's design, no-till farming leverages the power of diversity and cover crops. Instead of leaving the soil bare between growing seasons, farmers plant cover crops like grasses or legumes that act as sort of living shields, right? A hardy ground cover will protect the soil from erosion and it will retain they it will retain more moisture because there's a crop on it and it will add organic matter as some of those ground crops and ground covers decay right that's that's there's so much that's symbiotic about this one of the things that we can do is when it's time to plant the main crop the cover crop is left to decompose enriching the soil with essential nutrients The benefits of no-till agriculture extend far beyond soil conservation. By reducing soil disturbance, this practice enhances water infiltration. Remember, the, the more nooks and crannies, as opposed to huge hunks, the better. And till is going to give us more huge hunks because it's it's moving the soil structure and, com- and compacting the soil in certain places, which is going to make that happen. So we're going to have improved water quality and reduced runoff. And it also preserves the habitat for beneficial insects such as pollinators, oh, all hail the bees, and natural pest controllers, fostered a balanced ecosystem within the agricultural landscape. Additionally, by sequestering carbon in the soil, no-till farming plays a vital role in mitigating climate change. Yes, you heard it here. I think it's inspiring to see how vegan agriculture combined with practices like no-till farming can regenerate our soil, enhance biodiversity, and combat climate change. By supporting farmers who embrace these methods and incorporating them into our own gardening practices, we become part of the solution, actively contributing to a more sustainable and resilient future. As I come to the end of this episode, I encourage you to look into no-till agriculture, look into soil science, explore the research, check out some webinars, go to NASA and check out some of the things that they're doing with the soil. Yes, the reason NASA studies soil science is because the Earth is a planet and is part of our solar system. And that means that NASA gets to study it. NASA studies it out boots on the ground like I used to when I used to work for the GLOBE program. And also we have satellites that study soil moisture and various other facets of the soil so that we can really essentially take care of this natural resource much, much better, right? So there are lots of different ways that you can get involved if you are interested in finding out more about soil and soil science and how veganism uh, and soil science really interact. I I think that there's a way that we can cultivate a future where no-till agriculture and vegan practices are at the forefront of of sustainable land use, right? We can nurture our soil and we can empower ourselves and each other to make a lasting impact. I hope that you, I hope that you really try and look at this, right? Because by reducing our reliance on traditional sort of agricultural practices and animal agriculture, we also free up vast amounts of land that can be rewilded, restored, or used for regenerative practices. Imagine the possibilities. Forests can reclaim their territory, wildlife habitats can flourish, and carbon sequestration can be enhanced, which is crucial as far as climate change. Vegan agriculture is not just a solution for sustainable food production. It's a catalyst for ecological restoration. And of course, not to mention, it saves so many animals from suffering. Now, this is this is ultimately always going to be the thing I come back to. And I just wanted to say that part of it, that yes, of course, I always acknowledge that at the forefront for me is always going to be being cruelty-free, keeping animals from suffering. On a sad note, I did want to tell you that, unfortunately, if you heard my episode from last time about Riley Rat, unfortunately, Riley Rat died. And in fact, he died the day that 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 previous episode came out. According to his caregiver, who I handed him off to, she said that he had some sort of a neurological issue, likely due to the glue from the glue trap. And uh, and he just didn't make it. He was he just that was it. And she said that she held him in her hands as he died. And, uh, and I'm so grateful to you, Harley, for, uh, for taking such good care of Riley. He was, he was a special, special little baby rat. And, uh, 
And I would love to see those glue traps be a thing of the past. And if you want to get in touch with Home Depot at any time and encourage them to stop selling them, please do. I think that would be amazing if you did that because uh, you could help save the lives of countless critters. And in fact, to make it even sadder, uh, we had a, a beautiful sort of neighborhood cat who, this beautiful gray kitty, who ate one of the rats that was poisoned and and he died too. So this is this is a crisis, right? Here in New York City especially, the way that they've decided to manage the rodent problem is not to go, let's really make sure everybody is composting their food scraps instead of throwing them in the trash to sort of mitigate the rat population. Instead, they're just encouraging, you know, put out traps, put out glue traps, put out whatever, put out poison. And they're decimating the rat population, but they're also decimating the other critters, the wild critters, certainly, and the feral ones like this kitty who died. Uh, I told my husband that that this kitty died and he got really sad, too, because he's seen him. We've all seen that gray kitty and he's just gone and he's gone because he ate a rat that had eaten the poison. And it's just a horrible, awful way to try and mitigate this issue. I, it, it doesn't make any sense to me to do it that way because uh, I'll be honest, the house where I'm seeing most of the poison, I, I walk by it today to take my compost to the compost bin. And let me just tell you, this is probably more than you wanted to know, but there are several dead rats just sit, just lying in, in the middle of uh, right in front of this house. And so I'm going to be going to bury them. Why? Because they should not be just sitting out there, uh, dead. It's awful. It's awful thinking about this is what this, these people have decided that they should do to take care of the rat problem near their house. And I'm like, are you are you spending any time putting the compost into the compost bin that's literally at the end of the block? Are you making sure that your trash bags don't sort of hang out over the big bins and instead closing the bins fully so the rats aren't having as easy a time to get in there? Are you doing those things? Are you covering the stuff that they could find interesting with netting to make sure that they can't get in? Are you making sure all the holes to your house are plugged in? I mean, there are the, the we talked about it last week that there are lots of things that you can do and I don't think that they're doing any of them. They're just putting out poison. And so I encourage you, if you've listened this far, don't do that. (laughs) Don't put out poison to try and and, and mitigate the population numbers of the critter that was here before we were, right? The the rodents were here before before us. They just were. And so... um, I would love to I would love to see us come up with better ways to deal with this rather than to put out something that's going to kill not only them, but other creatures as well. All right. I hope that you have gotten something out of this episode. I am Isolde Trachtenberg. If you are interested in more, get in touch with me. I'm happy to uh, to talk to you about this as soil, especially is close to my heart. And uh I I would like to know from you, actually, if you're getting something out of these episodes. Honestly, I'm thinking of, and I know this is the tail end of the show, but I'm thinking of of folding the Vegan Life Solutions episodes back into the Monday episodes because uh, I'm just not sure I'm going to keep doing this, the the Vegan Life Solutions. I might, but I, I just am not sure if I can. So if you're really getting something out of this, Drop me a comment. Let me know, because if not, if I'm not hearing from anybody that they're actually getting stuff out of this, then I think I will be starting with the week after next, folding the Vegan Life Solutions back into the Monday, because I have one last episode left in the Veganism and the Environment series, and then uh, I may be calling it a day for that series and also for this Friday show. And in fact, one last thing, I have started another podcast, and that's part of why I'm trying to sort of become more uniform with how I'm doing this. The podcast is called The Taste of New York, and it's all about cool stuff that's happening that you can do, see, hear, taste, and experience in New York City. Whether it's permanent installations or stuff that's only here for the weekend and gone, you're going to hear about it on that show. So if you decide you want to know more about what's going on in New York City, if you live here, or if you're going to be visiting, I'm hoping that the show is going to be something that's going to be super helpful to people who are thinking of coming to the city to find cool off the beaten path things to do. Certainly some things, you know, like, yes, I will probably be be reviewing the shows I see. I, I, I'm a theater nerd, so I see as many shows as I can afford. And I will also be 
reviewing the restaurants I go to. Yesterday, I went, for example, to Pier 57 for the very first time. Interesting place. Uh, And I have some thoughts on that, and they will probably be on the podcast. So, uh, yeah, I hope that you enjoy that, too. Sign up for it if you love New York City, if you're visiting New York City, or if you live here. I would love to even chat with you about that sometime. All right, until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Solutions Podcast, reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in. (music) 